You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. Um, we're still in Judges, still, still with Samson, Samson. Uh, and we are getting ready to uh, tell his story in the worst way, right? Uh, worst way? Best way? Well, I, you know, I actually think it's in the way that the author intended it to be read. Um, you know, he, Samson is not a likable guy. And no. when you really stop and look at what he does and how he behaves, you, you can't help but feel like he's a little bit of a scumbag. Are we allowed to say that about Bible figures? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, that's kind of the common vernacular. But I, I know when you say he's not a likable guy and, and he's not someone to be looked up to, I mean, and I know last time you mentioned <laughs> Hercules and things like that, you look at what Hercules did, a lot of his stuff, I mean, not mm-hmm. likable by our standards, but by, uh, by Greek standards, hey, he's, he's right on up there. So, Well, you know, that's a whole debate well, we won't get into today, but something to be aware of is how much has Greek culture influenced our understanding of these stories? Are are you saying that uh, a lot of the way that Christianity views the world has, has come through the uh, Hellenistic lens? The lens of Plato. Uh, Yeah, uh, it really has. And actually that, that plays into the story, uh, believe it or not, because not only is Samson very similar to Hercules, I, we're going there way sooner than I anticipated, but we might as well flow with it, right? Uh, I mean, so, let, let's not like, let's not re- exhaust all your notes, but if you have a quick point, let's well, go for that. You know, the Philistines. Uh, we know that they came to Canaan through Crete and Cyprus. We've brought this up before. Sure. Yeah. These are um, the, the birthplace of a lot of the Hellenistic ideas, those Greek ideas, and so it makes sense that this is something that is being directly combated in the Canaanite conquest and sure. during the time of the judges. And so I think we as Bible readers need to actually stop and ask ourselves, are we reading this through a view, a lens that was rejected by God, specifically in the person of the Philistines, in our modern reading? Yeah, that, and, that, that makes sense. And and yeah, so it's, I don't know, it's, it's very confusing to me. Uh, just all the way with the connections that we've lost. And mm-hmm. it's been it's been really refreshing going back and looking at them with a lens of like an honest take of, hey, what is it that, you know, what what is it that we've taken out of this that we shouldn't? What is it we we've inserted into the story that we shouldn't? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so I, I've really been enjoying going through this. I, I, especially, I mean, there's so much in the in the Gideon story I had never realized. That's the one that has been the most standout <laughs> to me so far. It's a great story. I mean, there's so much in there. And yeah, and Samson, it just builds because Samson has more space devoted to him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it, it actually is the most complete narrative. But Gideon, he, he's actually far more likable than, than Samson is, even with all of his flaws. Right. And you know, that, that should tell you something right there. And I actually uh, found myself getting mad <laughs> as I was researching this because I just wanted to go back in time and like smack Samson and go, you know, you, you had all the advantages. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that was really what the birth narrative, narrative set up for us is that he did have all these advantages mm-hmm. and we should expect great things. And so when we leave that behind and we, and we go into the, the next chapter, which is uh, chapter 14, uh, we're supposed to be shocked. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes we forget that sometimes the Bible should be shocking and we need to stop reading it like we've heard the story a million times and we need to actually just go along with what's on the page. Mm-hmm. And I, I know I've said that on so many different episodes, but it's so true. And you can't, you can't say it enough. And, and, and we say that not only for the benefit of, of anyone listening, but we also say that for our own because, mm-hmm. because I mean, you and I have re- I've read Bible story after Bible story, uh, mm-hmm. so many times that that even for us, uh, you know, kind of that that age, the edge se- seems to be worn off on occasion. Yeah, and so we need to remind each other that this this is a nutty story with uh, <laughs> about a, a terrible person, um, right? And and how 
I don't even know. So it's, let's right. let's get into it and we'll talk more about okay, so, it as it goes on. So part of the setup, we, we've got this birth narrative that presents Samson as quasi-divine, and that's going to be important. Um, you know, he's specifically created by God for the specific purpose of beginning to deliver the Israelite from the Philistines. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been placed in a family where his mother has some theological training and understanding of God's law and what's expected of her from, you know, by God. Yeah. Um, his, his birth narrative really ties him to the history of Israel, but it also points us ahead to the birth narrative of Jesus himself. And because of this, we, we are set up to, to expect those great things. And I wanted to pause for a moment before we get into chapter 14, because we ended last week, we were talking about that last verse. Oh, well, before we got distracted by other things, but that last verse in chapter 13, it says that the spirit of the Lord began to drive him was mm -hmm. Robert Alter's translation of that, which I really like. And, and there is a debate here with scholars. It, does this belong at the end of chapter 13 or should it be at the beginning of 14? So if you put it at the end of 13, we're talking about Samson's condition, that he's being driven by God. Mm -hmm. And this puts it in the terms of vocation. Uh, it puts it in the terms of um, his state of being. But if you move it towards the 14th chapter, now we're saying that God is actively involved in the events of chapter 14. Right. And we're saying that the, that his mission is now what the Spirit's driving him mm -hmm. to do in the next chapter. Right. And, you know, there's a case to be made for both, because if it is at the end of 13, and it is about that condition, this, this calling to be called by God and to have this condition is to be set aside for a specific purpose. It's to be at odds with your society and culture. And it's... Um, often to be expressed in unusual words and actions. And we see this most notably with the prophets. And we discussed earlier, I believe it was the first episode on Samson, that the prophets and the Nazarites are deeply tied. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't lose that. But at the same time, now we've got chapter 14, and these events seem so counter to what we should expect because they open up in, in Samson seeking a Philistine wife. Well, yeah, it, yeah, it, you're saying if we if we put that at the beginning of 14, mm -hmm. because it does seem kind of weird that the spirit of the Lord would drive him where to, to, <laughs> to where uh, to where yeah. the ladies are. Right. <laughs> and the wrong kind, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's the weird thing, because everything that falls in 14 is just it, it seems uh, you know, it doesn't flow with our idea of what a holy man would do because we know the Nazarites were considered to be holy. So we open up chapter 14, verse 1, with Samson goes down to Timnah. So the first time we hear about Timnah is the story of Judah and Tamar. Mm -hmm. So we have a woman and we have deception. And we, this is a tip off. We need to be paying attention. Things aren't what they seem. What they seem. Okay. So this is um, actually when it's brought up in Judah and Tamar's story. This is the the news that Tamar receives that Judah is going down to Timnah for the sheep shearing, and so Timnah is a um, it's a Philistine town. Uh, today it's known as Tel El Batashi. Sorry, Tel El Batashi. Okay. Um, so we could actually go visit this place. It originally probably yeah. looks a little different now. Maybe just a touch. I think it's dustier. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. I know it wasn't the grave of joke, but it originally belonged to Dan. And the thing was, uh, by the time Samson came along, the Philistines had taken it over. And Samson leaves his hometown to go to this place. And this is a tip off. Another one that why is Samson able to go between these two towns, uh, you know, an Israelite town and the Philistine town? Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be like that. Right. Yeah. They're just they're Yeah. It, it is really funny because we we are presented this in Sunday school so often. The Philistines, these very bad people who were who are oppressing Israel. But yeah, Samson just kind of hops back and forth. It's yeah. their neighbors. He, he wonders. Yeah. Between the two places, which. It's kind of in keeping with the idea of the Nazarite because the Nazarite doesn't function as an Israelite, but at mm -hmm. the same time, he shouldn't be a Philistine either. 
So right. who is he? And and in being a Nazarite, is that what allows him to occupy the space between two cultures? These are all questions we have to grapple with. Right. And I don't know if there's a really good answer for this other than God's able to redeem everything. So, you know, when in doubt, that's the answer. You take that so. for what it is. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, Webb picked up on the, the literary device. This is the first of Samson's downward movements. Almost mm. every time Samson goes someplace, he goes down. And okay. so, you know, that's not a good thing. That's always a negative. And, you know, Webb made this really interesting uh, connection that I just, I loved because it was kind of an aside in his, um, in his commentary, but he says that Samson winds up looking more like a chaos monster than a deliverer. Okay. And that, it, it, it sparks something in my head. So. Okay. So are we going to, what are we talking about? Leviathan? <laughs> what are we talking about? Um, yes. Okay. Because I, okay. There's this idea that because Samson is a Nazarite, he was specifically created by God for the specific purpose. He is a judge of Israel. He has to be holy. And. So that means he's got to be good. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing. If you go over to Jud, um, sorry, Job chapters 40 and 41, mm -hmm. where God is challenging Job and he's discussing the behemoth and the Leviathan, both chaos monsters. They're both known to all of the ancient Near Eastern cultures. They're feared. Um, most of the time in the creation stories of the ancient Near East, uh, these beings had to be killed and you know sometimes they actually became part of the creation of the earth but in job god speaks of these beings as if they're pets they're, they they aren't scary to him he he created them he actually speaks of kind of their beauty you know it's it's like somebody with the with the furless cat uh you know it, it's if you love them they're beautiful if you don't they're they're ugly the the hairless cat i'm sorry my daughter wants one yes I don't know why. <laughs> My daughter's strange. We should move on so, from that. Anyway. I just can't, I can't <laughs> deal with the hairless cats. But if you go back, and I'm not going to read through those passages, but if you go back and read through those passages with Samson's story in mind, you're going to see some similarities. Um, can Samson be subdued? Can he be conquered with ropes and cords? Can he be led, ar lay on, led around on a leash by girls? Uh, can you make him your servant? And, you know, he's a creature without fear. And so I think Joe, um, sorry, Webb was actually onto something when he compares Samson to this chaos monster, because chaos monsters serve our God. Mm -hmm. They threaten other gods. And I love that, that distinction that our God is not frightened. He doesn't have to bully or intimidate these chaos mon monsters. They, they belong to him. Mm hmm. And only the truly powerful can have a pet like that. Hmm. So, That's interesting. I hadn't, and it's funny. I've read through Job many mm -hmm. times, but it's like that that line I hadn't noticed. That can you will you will you put him on a leash mm -hmm. for your girls? Like that's really funny to me. Now now put that in context with Samson, and what's going to happen with him both in the story here with uh, the Philistine wife, and then with Delilah mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. That's what the Philistines are trying to do with Samson, they're trying to tame God's chaos monster. The Philistines cannot do it. And that's mm -hmm. what makes the story hopeful. And okay. yeah. That's wild. That's wild. <laughs> Isn't that great? I mean, I, I, like I said, I think it was just kind of an aside for Webb, but it, it, it just, it, it went off bells and buzzers in my head. So, but back to Samson, Judges uh, 14 verses two and three. He sees this Philistine girl and he demands that his parents go get her for his wife. Mm -hmm. You don't do that. Right. <laughs> this is the wrong thing to do. Um, and, then, and that, again, that we talked about, what, did Samson know he was special? And I think, mm -hmm. I think this is the, I think this is the attitude. I'm just going to repeat it for the sake of anyone who mm -hmm. didn't listen last week. But, uh, you know, uh, I think this is for, you know, the attitude of someone who was told they were special and, and who feels entitled. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, the parents, I mean, they, they really push back and they, they, their objection is that the Philistines are uncircumcised and they don't like that. Now, here's the thing. In most Semitic cultures, in most of the people of that time and place, 
they practiced circumcision. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just the Israelites. But the Philistines are so far outside the cultural norms, they don't even do this. Right. So they're saying not only are these bad guys, these are really bad guys, and you don't want to be connected with them in that intimate of a way. Fair enough. Well, I mean, they, they expected great things from Samson. He is, he's their special boy. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you think about how many of us expect great things out of our children and they have, they weren't even, they weren't even uh, the product of a prophecy. <laughs> right. God didn't show up and announce their birth for us. And you, you got to kind of give the parents a little bit of slack, I think, in this, because it makes sense that they expect so much from him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but Samson, as you pointed out last week, you know, there's this phrase, go get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Mm-hmm. There, there's no moral implication with this right. It, it's she looks good to me is basically what he's saying. She's suitable for mm-hmm. me. She meets my standards. Yeah. And Samson's standards, uh, as we're going to find out as the story progresses, they aren't all that high. Yep. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, but he, you know, but more than that, he, he's setting his own standards. He isn't worried about the standards that God set for him or for the people of Israel. And, you know, this is the biblical version of, I like it, so it's got to be good. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, and you got to wonder how old he was here. I mean, because in this culture, you married fairly young, so mm-hmm. he's not married. So, you know, he's got to be just full of hormones. So <laughs> headstrong I mean, teenage boy. Yeah. I mean, early twenties, maybe <laughs> latest early twenties. Yeah. Think about what your standards were at that age and get back to me. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> no, I was, I was saying to the general male populace, you know, to, yeah, think about what your standards were when you were that age. And then yeah. tell us if you thought they were terribly godly. Right. Well, I have a whole speech on that, but we'll save that for something else. Fair enough. So, um, yeah, but, and you also pointed out that this was echoing these verses, uh, Judges 17.6 and 21.25, the last verse of the book of Judges. And was, Go ahead. Was it the people did what was right in their own eyes? In those days, there was no king. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so Samson really is, he's the model for what's unfolding with the nation. I mean, he's rejecting God's stated rules and standards. He's defining good and evil according to what he doesn't like, his own ideas and taste. He, he's not being who he was created to be, which as an Israelite is a son of God, or even as a Nazarite. And in rejecting his identity, he's rejecting God. Mm-hmm. And it's going to cost him everything in the end. And you know, his parents, they, they see what's, what's on the horizon. I believe his mother did. I mean, you know, go back to what she said to his father whenever the announcement came. He's going to be a Nazarite from the day he's born until the day he dies. Mm-hmm. And so she, I think she sees it. As a matter of fact, she's going to dis... I don't remember. If, okay, I, okay. I know I know you mentioned you. I don't know if we talked about this specifically. I think we kind of alluded to it. To it and, and, but in her, in her adding that... Mm-hmm. Because I can't remember if we talked about this in the past. And her adding the death part, she was adding to what the angel of the Lord told her. Yes, she was. And so, in order to to try, she was trying to make the promise better, but added a curse. Pretty Is much. That, I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, that's because you know it, who knows. It could have been that it was he's to be a Nazarite from the time he's born, deliver Israel, and once Israel's delivered, then he can be free of his vow. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I'm, that's pure speculation on my right. part, but to me, that's what it sounds like whenever we compare those things. Well, and that's the thing with Samson's story. We, we have so many areas where we have to stop and ask if he'd married a nice Jewish girl from his village, what, what would have changed? Yeah. If he had obeyed the Torah, what would have changed? Yeah. Well, and, and, and as I think about it, and I'm still processing through this, this thought, it was just something that occurred mm-hmm. to me. Um, but just this idea that whenever, you know, and I think we've, we've mentioned something similar, whenever we try to make God's word better or more miraculous, or we try to clean up these heroes, it becomes something that drives people away. Yeah, um, it does When we damage. try to add to God's word. And, and we definitely see that in Genesis 3, and we're going to get to the point where we're going to see so many connections with Genesis 3. Mm-hmm. And 
it, it's it's the same story being repeated, but like you said, with those different elements where God is so relational mm-hmm. and he allows people to impact th- how he's interacting with them, what he's doing through them. And I think Samson's just a great example because in, in verse four, um, we get this little glimmer of hope and I'm just going to read it. It says, his father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking, this was God seeking, an opportunity against the Philistines. At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. So this brings three questions. Did Samson know it was from the Lord? Is this meticulous determination? Or is God using Samson's predilections for his own purposes? Mm -hmm. And does this indicate that God approved of what Samson was doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, and and do we take this as a strong warning against missionary dating? Don't even get me started <laughs> on missionary dating. Uh, too late. Okay, so, so <laughs> no. Okay, this is one of my pet shoot. peeves with Christian movies, with Christian books. We will sit and tell our young women, do not date uh, non-believers. Every freaking Christian romance novel out there, okay, 98%. Let's give the 2% a break. That's almost always the theme. I'm so glad I've never read one of these. So, yeah. And so just stop, okay? Yeah. Missionary dating, it's ridiculous. And um, again, we will save that for another project. Uh, Hint, hint, hint. So first question, if we we want to vindicate Samson, then we say absolutely. Mm Mm-hmm. This is God's plan. He's uh, doing this on God's direct order. And the sages go so far to say that God made this marriage desirable to, to Samson by having the girl convert, that she converted to Judaism during this time. And so it was okay for Samson to marry her. Now, we know if there's a convert from an outside nation, that's okay. Right. That person is acceptable. We've seen that in Judges. We also saw it in Joshua. Um, over and over again, we've seen where people who have joined with God's community are, mm-hmm. are okay. But I've also seen enough, uh, I also have enough friends who uh, converted to Catholicism to get married where their wife wanted to get married, <laughs> and then they never show up to church again. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that to me, that carries pretty much zero weight. Well, and, <laughs> Even yeah. Even if it's true. E- well, and my problem with this this scenario, this explanation is Samson's attitude through the rest of the story, he, he gives no indication he cares. Right. I mean, God's decrees just really don't seem to mean a lot to him. Um, my, my second problem with this explanation is Samson's never identified as a prophet. His actions in his life are enacted prophecy, mm-hmm. but he never gets called by that title at all. Okay. Um, it, it's almost shockingly missing because by the time you get to the, the birth narrative, the fact that he is so different, the connection between the Nazarite and the prophets, you almost expect him to be a prophet. And Samson, he just, he never expresses that he's aware of God's will in any of this. It, matter of fact, we're, as we move forward, we're going to find most of his language is very narcissistic. I, 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 me, me, me. Over and over mm-hmm. again. Uh, so I, I have a problem with the idea that Samson is operating with full knowledge. I, he, he really, matter of fact, he seems to be really driven again by his own desires, what's right in his eyes. He says that. So I kind of reject that. Question two, um, if you believe that, that God will cause a person to sin in order to achieve his purposes, then you can be okay with meticulous determination. However, I have a problem with that. And my problem is because James 13, uh, chapter one, verses 13 through 18 directly rejects this idea. Okay. And um, I am going to read this because it's, you know, scripture. Important. Yeah. Let no one say he is tempted. I am being tempted by God for God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each, word, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is, has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings, uh, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift, good and every perfect gift 
is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, from whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So if we say that Samson is being tempted by God, we're having to totally contradict James. Sure. And, but what I find, found interesting, listen to the words. He's enticed by his own desire, gives birth to sin. Sin brings forth death. Do not be deceived. Every good and uh, perfect gift comes down from above. Samson's been on a downward journey. He's being enticed by his own desires. His sin is going to give birth to, to death. Mm-hmm. James could be writing about Samson. It, it's almost as if he, he took all of the, the principles of Samson's story and distilled them down into a few concise verses. Yeah, and uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, so I think the third question is kind of answered by the second question, but James actually shed some more light uh, on it in chapter four. And he, um, you know, just got approve uh, of Samson's actions. So this is chapter four, four starting in verse one. What, co- what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire, you do not have, so you murder, you covet, you cannot attain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passage. Passions, you adulterous people, do you not know that a friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose there is no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to the Lord. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy turned to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Yeah. It's Samson's story. Yeah. I mean, it (laughs) really is. It's, yeah, that's... I hadn't, I hadn't put those together, but it really is whenever you look at it, it is, it is that yeah. he's following his desires. He's, he's not, not following what God wants. And he's going to be quarreling with his brothers. Everything he asked for is for his own desires. That was the, that was the point I was trying to remember. Yeah. I was like, there was one that was like perfectly aligned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was the, yeah. But when, when he does like, finally submit to God which results in his own death. Mm-hmm. But that's where, why we still celebrate him. Right. And because and he drew near to God, God drew near to him. And it was in those moments. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I loved, you know, I can only claim that God sometimes is very gracious to me because the, when I was studying this and reading through it, I'm like, these words are all reminding me of something else. Mm-hmm. And I began looking for the verses and, and of course it's James. And so I always like to put the caveat out there whenever I see something, not so you go, oh, well, Emily knows so much, but so that, you know, hey, not everybody holds this opinion. Right. And, and, and check it out. Mm -hmm. Check out some other scholars, see if they've done some work in that area. If, you know, don't, don't build a theology on something we say necessarily, unless, well, just don't build it on (laughs) what we say. Check it out. Double check everything. Always double check. But, you know, the other thing, too, is Samson is, an, is a friend of the Philistines. And everything about this upcoming marriage proves that he's a friend of the Philistines, mm-hmm. which makes him an enemy of God. And that is an interesting situation to be in since he's called by God. Mm-hmm. But you were talking about Jonah. This is not an unusual situation for people called by God who, who want to resist or don't follow through with the right attitude. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, and, and Samson, I think this is why he never rises to the heights that the other judges do. Um, you know, the other judges were, were flawed, obviously, but Samson never does even the most basic things that the other judges managed to accomplish. Mm-hmm. And that, that's telling, but, you know, he's an outsider to his people until his death. He's an outsider to the Philistines. He, he, he never gets to embrace his full destiny as it could have been. Mm-hmm. At least I don't think he, he does. Yeah. So we, so you're saying that the entire story is a tragedy. It is. As we like to, we like to read it as a, as a heroic epic, mm-hmm. but it's, but it's tragic. 
and, and well, you know, this this kind of leads to to the fourth question is how then is any of this God's plan? You know, in in verse four, we're told that this is God's plan. So how does God pull this back together so that it does serve him? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I think, go ahead. Well, say, I, think you, I think you can, I think you can look at that in, in general, like mm-hmm. the world in general, how does God manage to pull this all back together so that it glorifies him? You know, <laughs> and goodness, there's been libraries written about that. Yeah. And, and, and I say that not to be disrespectful as though, as though he's struggling. Mm-hmm. I'm struggling to comprehend it. Mm-hmm. He's not the one struggling. Right. So whenever, we, whenever we talk about, you know, God, you know, pulling these things back together, it's, it's, it's not, I don't know, but it, it tends to, it, people tend to take that as it paints a picture of a weak God who's wringing his hands going, oh, how am I going to fix this? <laughs> no, he's not. And he's not playing catch up to any of us either. Right. He's not running behind going, oh, goodness, they broke it and I got to fix it before we can go forward. Yeah. But just because we can't comprehend how God's getting it done doesn't mean he can't comprehend how he's getting it done. Well, and I think, <laughs> I think that's one of the points of Samson's story. Even though Samson is out of control. I mean, he's completely out of control. He can barely control himself, but God is fully in control. Mm -hmm. So that's the reminder that even though we don't see how Samson's actions are serving God in the moment, and the only reason why we can look at his story at all and say, hey, this is God's desire and God's will that things happen this way, is because we know the end. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think Samson is doing any of this because he's being some great faithful person. I, I think he really is doing exactly what the Bible says he's doing. He's being ruled by his own desires and not having any self-discipline, but God is, he's redeeming it. Yep. And so, um, you know, this is the confusing part of Samson's story because on one, one hand, he doesn't seem to care at all about what God laws, what God's law says. But on the other hand, he's kind of fastidious in the things that he does honor and respect mm-hmm. because he, he's not cutting his hair. He's, he's not even um, going around grapes. I will get to that part in a minute, but I think in, in my opinion, what I'm seeing is he's obeying the God, uh, sorry, obeying the laws that serve him. Sure. And well, who doesn't do that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think even the hair, I, hair in the Bible is such, it's such a tip off. It, it is such a, an indicator of people who have this very ambiguous quality. Uh, Joseph mm-hmm. in Genesis, he's always cutting his hair. There's always something going on with his hair and his clothes. And Joseph mm-hmm. is a very ambiguous character. Uh, Esau, again, very ambiguous. Do we love him? Do we hate him? Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Uh, Absalom, we've got all this vanity and pride that go along with his hair, but at the same time, he is the hero okay. of his sto- of the story for um, Amnon and Tamar. Mm-hmm. So, and he was the, he was the guy to be king. Mm-hmm. He had all the, the characteristics needed to be a good king, but his own vanity did him in. So... Hmm. Hair, hair is very, um, it's supercharged in the Bible. I mean, it's, it's just, okay. it, it, when you see supercharged hair, <laughs> that's the episode name. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, well, and you know, and hair, uh, even in Jesus life, when the, when the woman washes Jesus feet with her hair, don't you know what kind of woman this is? Mm-hmm. And why did she have unbound loose hair? Because she was a prostitute. So that. That yeah, all especially in Greek culture, mm-hmm. and then that. Well, we can get on a whole another tear on that, but uh, precisely, we'll, we'll put the episode to that in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so anyway, Samson he's going down to Timna. Uh, he's got his his parents with him. Uh, he it doesn't necessarily indicate any approval uh, that that the parents are approving of this, but I think we got to remember these are parents with the world's strongest son. <laughs> okay. They're the parents of the world's strongest son, but I, I don't, it's not specifically said that it's approval, no. but, but it does say his father went down with him. And if we're looking at anytime mm-hmm. Samson moves, he goes down and it's a, it's a mm-hmm. moral equivalency. Okay. I think we can probably draw a parallel with the father. So um, 
that that the overindulgence of the son is is the moral degradation to his, Samson's parents. Well, you know, the father's bad attitude with the the man of God, the the angel of the Lord, um, that foreshadows a lot of Samson's attitudes with people and culture around him. So. Yeah, maybe. And maybe this is the problem. Maybe Samson took too much after his earthly father instead of his mother. Possible. And yeah. I, I mean, I, that's speculation and not, you know, made on the fly. But so as they're going down now, we're, we're assuming that mom was with them. Um, it would be normal for mom to have been with them. But at some point they they separate the the passage here doesn't say it. But we find out later in the story that the parents are not with him. When a young lion came out towards him roaring, uh, he's in the vineyards of Tam uh, of Timna. Uh, his Nazarite vow really would have made going around the vineyards normal instead of going through. So the most scholars think that possibly the parents were taking the most direct route through the vineyards. Samson was going around. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. y'all go on. I'll catch up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the reason why I'm saying there's this indication that he is following the rules that suit him. And so this is specifically a young lion. This is not a secondhand lion. So <laughs> had to. No. Uh, but it's in an unexpected place because anybody who's had any dealing with wild animals is typically, unless they're enticed with dog food, um, they, they tend to stay away from places where human beings are working. Right. And vineyards require a lot of effort and a lot of labor. So there's usually somebody in the vineyard almost all year round. Right. And so the fact that there's a lion where it doesn't belong, Webb sees this as a kind of enacted prophecy that the, okay. you know, the lion and Samson are both wild and untamable and neither one's where they're supposed to be. And... Mm. As the symbolism progresses, God is manifest in Samson's strength, and the, the strength is first manifest in the death of the lion, but then it also is manifest in Samson's own death. Right. Yep. And sweetness is found in the carcass of the lion, and there's sweetness for the nation of Israel in Samson's death. Hmm. And so we, and through this, the fact that Samson, his whole life, there's going to be these these parables and riddles that all have to ha be interpreted. It's another connection back to Joseph because Joseph in his dreams, mm -hmm. all the dreams had to be interpreted. And if you remember, Joseph is considered the prototype of the Nazarite right? because he was always separate from, from his brothers. He was separated from the Egyptians. He never had a place to really belong and fit in. And it wasn't until his death that he was taken back and buried with his brothers in Shechem. So uh, we also find out that Samson, in his death, is buried in the, the grave of Manoach's uh, father. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of parallels with Joseph here. So verse 6, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Again, that, that rushing language. And although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion as one tears a young goat. Now, I've never torn a young goat. I've never torn a young goat either. But the fact that... The spirit rushed upon him where with Afnael and Jeff, the, the, the spirit came upon them. It's, mm -hmm. it's not that emphatic, intense language. Um, Gideon, you know, the spirit, he was clothed in the spirit. Eglon, Shamgar, and Jael, they kill with, with weapons. Uh, they, they stab, they, they, you know, they hit, they, so they strike. Mm -hmm. uh, Samson kills with his bare hands. So he is more, he's more primal. Okay. Is kind of how he's being presented. Uh, he, he is the embodiment of the wild man. Most of his life he spends on the edges of civilizations. And, and he becomes a beast to, do, to defeat a beast. And he does that in this moment, but he's also going to do it with the Philistines. And we've already referred to it some, and I kind of hesitate to open up this can of worms because we've got Samson and Hercules kind of go together. Sure. But also a kid do from uh -huh. Gilgamesh, who we talked about with Jacob wrestling with God, fits with Samson too. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to go too deep, but I just want to hit a few highlights so that people can see it. And like I said, we might come back to this in a wrap-up episode so we can go, go deeper. Um, 
each of the stories has a quasi divine man. Their their origin is, is divine, and they were either created or birthed by a god mm-hmm. uh, directly. Um, they're on the fringes of their cultures, and they're known for great strength. Uh, domesticating effects of women are what rob them of their strength and power in all three cases. Okay, uh, they're pr- presented as not entirely positive, but not entirely negative. There, there's this ambiguity, mm-hmm. just like there is with Samson, and you know, killing the lion with the bare hands. That is really the point that connects him the most to Hercules. Right. Yeah. And uh, James Crenshaw, he is a Bible scholar. He's got a book out called Samson and a Secret Betrayed, a Vow Ignored. And he he notes the connection. He said there's 12 episodes in the life of each man, Hercules and Samson. Mm-hmm. Killing the lion, betrayed by a woman, uh, forced to do labor because of another's treachery. Mm-hmm. They tear down the city pillars or gates. Pick one. Uh, they both grope in darkness. Uh, Hercules, it's while he's in the underworld. Uh, both voluntarily die, and then, of course, the semi-divine bir- births. And so I don't want to ignore the fact there are connections, but we shouldn't be surprised by this. I think this is one of the things that people get all hung up on. Oh, no, who who stole what story from who? It doesn't matter. Right. Uh, most of the time, the Bible stories are polemics against other stories. Mm-hmm. But the Hercules story... Um, it shouldn't surprise us that there's similarities because, as we said, the Philistines, they were Greek in origin. Mm-hmm. We already talked about how the Trojan War and how those stories um, played into this time frame. And we'd start having the wandering hero. So the, the fact that there, there's connections actually makes more sense than if there weren't. Right. And we should, we should be happy about this. So... With Ikidu, the, the shared themes are they're, they're remembered for being hairy, both of them. Mm-hmm. They were both seduced by women who led them deeper into a foreign culture. And in domesticating them again, they um, lose their power. And although they both lose their strength to these domesticating factors, Samson regains him. And this, this, this is the, the point that makes it a better story. Samson actually becomes wholly wild in his last moments in his service to God and, and reclaims everything he was supposed to be to accomplish his mission. Mm. A kid who doesn't. And so that's, that's the, the, the polemic aspect of that. And with Samson, we're supposed to see him as a wild man. We're supposed to see him as, as being, outside of the control uh, mm-hmm. of society. But at the same time, he's not so completely removed that he can't function within society because we're also going to see evidence that he can cross those boundaries. Right. So he, he's got the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he definitely plays politics in a lot of this. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, it, it, it gets interesting. So <laughs> carry on. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. So, um, so Samson, he kills this lion, walks away. Doesn't tell anyone. And you would think this would be a story that you would go back and tell everyone, hey, you know, this, I, I just killed a lion. We have different accounts in the Bible of people killing lions. It's, it, it's a sign of God's protection and strength and his favor. And right. so it, it's not something that you just, oh, I kind of forgot I did that today. I mean... <laughs> I, I dropped my phone a few minutes ago and I came and told you, hey, I dropped my phone and I managed to save it. So, I mean, it's these, yeah. these are the kinds it's of stories kind you of tell. Kind of a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. And, but the th- lion, not the phone. Well, my phone's a big deal too, but maybe, okay. I think, Fine. yeah. No, that's just, just that's just the, the <laughs> that's the culture we live in. Yeah. Yeah. The phone is kind of a big deal. So, go ahead. But, uh, you know, this is seen as the the first warning. It, it's a very graphic warning to Samson that this is this is what's going to happen with you, mm-hmm. and he he doesn't care. He, he it's can, not a morality lesson about keeping secrets from your parents. No, it's not. Oh, that's like, amazing. I, that's what I was told growing up. Yeah, in Sunday school. Don't feed them lion from, honey from the body of a lion. Yeah. Uh, if you needed that from Sunday school, then I'd need to know more about you because. 
Yeah. Where are you finding this lion, honey? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he he basically looks at the girl and kind of inspects her once again. She has no voice in the story at, up till during the wedding. Uh, there's no mention of whether she wants to marry Samson. It, it's right. He he basically picks her out. It's what it sounds like, you know, a horse at auction, and he it's very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. And so after some days, he goes back. So evidently at some point between the lion and checking out the girl for the second time, he goes back home with the parents, but then he returns and uh, he returned to take her. So we don't know how long that this this little interlude was. We know it's long enough for bees to take her residence in the carcass of a dead lion. Mm hmm. But in case you missed it, he saw this girl. She's right in his eyes. Um, she was, uh, she was like I said, yeah, right. Um, see, I'm reading my notes too fast. Uh, he takes her. So now we're connected back to Genesis three, mm -hmm. and Genesis three, Eve, see, Eve sees the fruit. It's good. Mm -hmm. She takes it. And we're connected to Genesis six. Yeah, sons As, of God. Yeah, we have a, a semi divine person. In the story, See. seeing a girl, seeing she's right in or good in his eyes, and then taking. Yeah. And we're also connected to Pharaoh and Sarah. Mm -hmm. And we're also connected to, that's Genesis 12, Genesis 34 with Shechem and Dina. Yep. So in almost every account where we find this, it's usually a man taking a woman who's inappropriate for him. Now, Genesis 3 that's different. I mean, but this is where Eve sets the cycle in place. Mm -hmm. And Genesis, um, in Exodus, sorry, in Exodus, we also have Moses' mother seeing that the baby's good and she takes him. And so the woman actually taking what is appropriate. So we begin okay. with a woman. Then, okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Have a woman taking what is not appropriate and then a woman bringing the first deliverer onto the scene by taking what is appropriate. And so now we got a question, who is Samson going to be? Is he going to be one of the sons of God who takes the inappropriate woman? Or is he going to be the deliverer? Well, and then, okay, and I don't know if you're going here, but then you, then you, then you have that. I'm sorry. I'm, Go ahead. I'm, yeah, the, the idea of the, the woman seeing and taking, and you have uh, Moses' mother seeing and taking the baby, seeing mm -hmm. and taking what's appropriate. Then you have Mary seeing the angel and, and taking. Yes. Um, because she does say, you know, she is. She does say, you know, do as you will. Yeah, and and she takes the gift. Um, so that's and then, a, another. And I don't know if that was where you're going in there. But not that's specifically, but it, it is because that's a really good point. The women in Genesis six were taken. Mm -hmm. They were not asked. They were not invited. They were not. You know, their consent was not needed. Sure. Where, where Mary is invited and she consents. And right. she not only consents, she, she willingly and joyfully mm -hmm. decides to participate with God. And so and the writer doesn't want you to miss this connection because if you'll notice, Samson turns aside and we're reminded that Samson isn't where he's supposed to be. And, you know, he's not even capable of staying on his own course where he's supposed to be. He, he turns aside and he sees the carcass of the lion. So we're mm -hmm. seeing again. He scrapes. He doesn't just take. He actively reaches out and works to get this honey. I right. mean, this is, this is an ordeal. Uh, it's taking by force. And he eats. Yeah. I mean, you're going, you're going to get honey out of a beehive this day and age. It's going to be work no matter how much you, uh -huh. <laughs> you no know, matter what. I mean, you don't, you don't have a bee suit. You don't have an electric knife. <laughs> right. you, I mean, yeah. you don't have a centrifuge. It's work. Precisely. And, and even the verb there to scrape, I mean, it indicates the level of work that he's having to, just to remove the honeycomb. And so you, we still have this connection going on. And now it's Samson, not just with the woman, but with the lion. This is what he's doing. Mm -hmm. and, but he adds another element. He gives. And he gives the honey to his parents. Right. And so there's no way we can disentangle the story from Genesis 3 because Eve, she sees, she takes, she, she eats, gives. she gives. Yeah. And in doing so, you know, she brings death into this world. 
And what what's Samson doing? He he's he is possibly bringing death, and I we do see that where there is death brought about by Samson's actions, specifically mm-hmm. the marriage of Samson to this woman. Right, and he, he's the, the really troubling part of this is that he's not just doing something that's wrong for him to do; he's involving people who are unaware. And by giving it to his parents and not telling them where it came from, where Adam was right there with Eve, and Genesis mm-hmm. is specific about that, he never spoke up, he never objected, he just accepted. The parents, they, they are deceived. And, you know, he's, he's not only breaking the rules himself, he, he's trying to get other people in, involved in his disobedience. Okay. And the writer, I mean, <laughs> the writer of Judges is brilliant. There's so much going on here because he's making a point. Uh, he, he, the word for swarm, the bees have swarmed in the land. It's almost always used of a gathering of holy people. Uh, Psalms 82.1, it's used specifically the divine council. Mm-hmm. Psalms 7.8, it's an assembly of people worshiping God. Psalms 1.5 is a congregation of the righteous. Uh, it's edah is the, is the word there. Mm-hmm. If it sounds familiar to edan, edah. Eden. Okay. So we're the writer wants you to look and see. He he wants you to put yourself right back in, into Genesis three because Eden was the place of ultimate community. Mm-hmm. It, well, and you have you have Eden. You have the Edenic connection, and basically, you know, in in that story, you have everyone people giving up where they were supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And so here you have. Uh, here you have uh, Samson representing that Israel is giving up where they're supposed to be. Yeah. And, and doing it willingly. Yeah, exactly. Well, and then look at how this is reversed, because if you go back to go forward into the New Testament, Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples mm-hmm. and he takes, he gives and they eat together. And Luke 22, 15 specifically says that, this was Jesus' desire, mm-hmm. for I've earnestly desired to take this Passover with you before my suffering. He, he's making certain that Jesus, his desire is for community, not to break community, right. but to create community, to restore community. And matter of fact, in 22.10, uh, and uh, Luke includes that scene element. He says, behold, uh, in the verses 12 and 13, he says that, this guy will show you where to find and you will find. So you, again, we're back to that seeing and taking. Mm-hmm. It's all part of Luke's narrative. And he's drawing on these same themes and saying, Jesus is going to reverse it all. And that's the thing. Jesus reverses it. Samson just resumes it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and we're seeing how Samson is not the, the, the judge and deliverer that he's supposed to be. And he's never going to be on the level of Jesus because he's not willing to submit to the father's will. And so, you know, these, these are major points. So this is the last we hear of the dad. And uh, the mom and the dad, they, they just disappear. And we're beginning to, to just keep building with, with this theme of um, reversal. The narrator tells us it's customary, and we know this from archaeological records, that the Philistine weddings were a big deal, that they're a feast, a, a marriage feast. Mm-hmm. So when we think of a marriage feast, and we're thinking of the end times, the, the, the fulfillment of the days, if you mm-hmm. will. Yeah. Uh, it's specifically a seven-day event, and it's drinking. Yeah. It's specifically... It's specifically set aside for the men to have a ball. It is a bachelor party on steroids. It's a bacchanal. <laughs> Seven day bacchanal, basically, is what you got. Pretty much, yeah. Now, but think about the, the difference in the, the celebration Christ wants to have with his bride, where the focus is Christ focusing on his bride, mm-hmm. not on the men around him, not on being the most popular. Now, the bride's going to celebrate Christ's presence. But Christ desires his bride. Mm -hmm. Samson doesn't seem, I mean, he really doesn't have any connection with this woman. 
there really isn't any kind of uh, affection that he shows towards her. And we're going to we're going to see this clearly demonstrated. So yeah. the Philistines basically said, hey, you know, obviously you don't have any friends with you. So we're going to bring 30 companions. Uh, that's how the ESV translated it. Uh, 30 companions. Now. Uh, I think it's the NRSV that translates it select men. But the, the point is elsewhere where it's used in judges, it's not men, it's warriors. And so 30 warriors were brought in for the wedding. They sound more like a security detail than they do companions. Yeah, well, no, I, what I find interesting is it says, you know, it says you don't have any friends with you or you don't, mm-hmm. you know, but my question to that is, did Samson not have any friends in general or did he not have any fr- people who are willing to go with him? It's a good question. We, we, yeah. we don't know. And I, and I don't know if does it specifically say he doesn't have any friends. Well, you say it doesn't have people with him. Or, well, you know. yeah. I think it's it's more that's kind of what's read into the text that he didn't have enough people to fulfill the 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 standard bridal party. Yeah, which I mean, which I mean, it's a wedding, mm-hmm. and and if someone's gonna you know if you have friends they're gonna go with you. Uh, weddings typically are, in Judaism, weddings are huge, and you know if you don't invite me to to the wedding, don't expect me to come to your funeral. I, it's, that's one of their idioms. And so the the idea that you would be invited to a wedding and not go is basically saying, I don't want any kind of relationship with you. Right. And so the fact that nobody's there with Samson, it makes you wonder what kind of person was he Mm -hmm. that even, I mean, it doesn't sound like it's a big deal to go to this Philistine town. Yeah. Well, in a way, uh, and then again, you, if, if he is the outsider, Maybe, maybe he thinks that going there is okay because he's representing what God wants to do. Maybe he does have friends. Maybe he has friends who are saying, uh, no, we're fine with you going <laughs> to do business, but we're not okay with you marrying her. Right, right. Or it's too dangerous for us. You're a big, strong guy. You can defend yourself. Right. We, you know, and that's the thing. We, we're left with all these questions. And. This is where I think if a woman had written the book, we would have way more details. But if, if a woman had, if I, I think of, yeah, I think if a woman had written the Bible, it'd be a lot thicker. <laughs> right. Um, so anyhow. Not in a bad way. I'm just saying they're like those details. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we want to know. Um, so so they, they do have this wedding ceremony and, and Samson proposes a wager. And he says, in, we're in verses 12 and 13. He says, you know, if you can solve my riddle, I'll give all of you a change of underwear and an outfit. I mean, that's, I, I'm sure the Bible says linen and some outer garments. It's underwear and, and clothes. So this is what he's promised them. But if. Yeah, there are the, 30 linens and 30 changes of clothes. Yeah. And so, and if they can't solve it, then they've each got to give him a set. And, okay, these guys are idiots, number one. Because they, uh, they agree. They, they don't, I mean, there's, there's no checking it out. Well, they're probably all drunk. <sighs> yeah, this is true. If they're at the wedding party, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know that I've ever been fold, pulled into a stupid bet <laughs> while drunk. Um, but I know that people tend to. It, yeah, uh, there's been too many injuries recorded for that not to be true. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So Samson poses this this riddle: Out of the eater came something to eat; out of the strong came something sweet. Now, you and I, we we know that the riddle is impossible to solve. They don't have the background information to figure this out. Right. Uh, no one knows about the lion and the honey except for Samson at this point. So Samson's cheating. Right. Yeah. This is yeah. He, he, again, not a good guy. Uh, under the rules of the game, kind of the standard operating procedure for this sort of thing, the guest would have looked at their present context in order to figure out what it might be. Mm-hmm. At this point in the show, if you have children listening to you, you might want to turn us off. So, 
Three, two, one. Your warning time is up. I I don't know what she's got planned here, so. Yeah, so. I might edit this out. We'll see. I'm kidding. Uh, hey, maybe this, not. I, I, I read this in more than one commentary, uh, so this, this is, is not, not me. This is not something you made up to be crass. This Precisely. Is, this is in the commentary. Go ahead. Precisely. Okay, so if you're at a drunken party, everybody's been drinking for days. Out of the eater came something to eat. Once I read this, it was so simple. Because when you get sick and you, well, when you get drunk, you get sick. So the first line. Out of the eater came, came something, something to, to eat. eat. So they're vomiting. Right. Um, not uncommon. The second part, you got to remember you're at a wedding party. And with Samson being the strong man and the groom. A lot of scholars have said this is specifically referring referring to sperm. So, okay, yeah, don't blame me. Crenshaw <laughs> said this. Block quoted again. Webb said this. She's going to cite this. Yes, I want you to know this was not me. Um, now Crenshaw claims that this is riddle did not originate with Samson. That this is actually a riddle that had existed before, and that's the reason why he's saying that this is one of the. The explanations. Okay. And that Samson actually adapts it for his own purposes. But we saw this with Jotham's fable earlier that, you know, the, the cultures are so intertwined. They did know each other's stories. They knew each other's riddles. Um, and this tells us that Samson really was a part of the Philistine culture. He is not just an outsider looking in that if he would know one of their, one of their riddles. Um, we're also got this riddle included because it does show Samson as character. I mean, he's not only is he cheating with mm -hmm. this riddle, he he is laughing at his sin. He, right. He's making a joke of what he did to himself and what he he did to others. Yeah. And yes, you know, we are not being shown a very pleasant picture of of Samson. And I, you know, I I've often heard you know, oh well, look how clever he's being, look how smart he's being, and and he's being very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. He's keeping with the rules and the expectations of, of his society, but he's not being honorable about it. Right. Just, just because something is legal does not mean it's uh, moral. Is that where we're going? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Which we should not get started on that whole road. So, um. No. <laughs> no. Oh, speaking so, of roads. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're right about an hour, so oh. let's. We have. To, is there anything? Is your next point long, or do we, we just want to wrap it up there? Um, no, we're gonna let's go ahead and wrap it up because we're actually going to go into a second riddle, and it's actually a little bit more involved and just as equally shocking. Um, so okay. um, yeah, we'll save that for next week. And nice little teaser there for okay. people who like scandalous content. Yeah, ending <laughs> on a cliffhanger. <laughs> right. Sorry to put the brakes on so like suddenly, <laughs> uh, but. That's where we are, and we'll be back next week with even more exciting Samson stuff. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Anyway, if you want to be part of the conversation, which who doesn't um, at this point, uh, hit us up on <laughs> Raven Creek SC. I'm already choking here. You're going to so, kill me. <laughs> sorry, Raven Creek SC uh, on all the social media. RavenCreekSC.com gets you to all of our shows and gets you to wherever you need to find us <laughs> if you want to. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we wanted people to contact us after this one. So anyway, uh, we'll be looking forward to your letters, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, if you like what you heard, please, please, please uh, hit, hit us up on iTunes, give us a review or a rating. Um, if you, uh, you know, if you care to support us, uh, hit it. I don't know. It's probably not the best time to ask, but if you care to support us on uh, financially, there is a, a, a donate button on uh, or a support link on the website. Uh, you know, help keep the show going, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes, or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening, and don't forget to join us next week.